Hey everyone, Dayland with another random making encounter. If you are new to the channel, thank you for watching. If you're returning, it is always good to see you. It's another nook. It's another Disney nook. This one is inspired by the Disney Dark Ride, Snow White's Scary Adventure. Now, before you start posting comments saying, Dayland, it is no longer Snow White's Scary Adventure. It is Snow White's Happily Ever After. I understand. But this is an homage. This is really a look back to the days when Disney rides, and in particular Disney dark rides, were intended to be cautionary tales for small children, meant to delight at times but terrify at others. Maybe you shouldn't take that apple from the scary, beyond all belief old lady, or maybe you shouldn't drive recklessly because you might end up someplace you don't want to be. Or maybe you shouldn't just follow me to the theater because you just never know what will happen. So, every time I dive into a Nook project, I like to give myself some challenges. I want to try something a little different. So in this particular Nook, the two things that I wanted to do was incorporate audio and lighting. So, thunder crash, thunder flash. So that is one aspect I wanted to try. The other thing, since this is inspired by a Disney dark ride, I wanted to incorporate UV LEDs and UV paint. More on that as we look at the project because UV paints are a bit of a challenge. So without any more preamble, let's just get right into the nook. I'm building the box first, but that really doesn't need to be done in this order. The most important thing is actually knowing what your interior space is, but I've actually started making the interior pieces and then create sort of a box within a box and then insert that into the nook itself, the exterior shell. That allows me to actually have a lot more space when I'm working and I don't have to try and work you know, really in this confined and tight space. It also helps because a lot of times painting directly on the box material can cause warping. Really the first thing that I need to do is design that interior space. And so I've, I've taken on sort of this process of making what would be sort of like stage flats or, or movie sets where I'm creating walls and I'm using big sheets of inexpensive materials, just regular old tag board or chipboard. And I'm creating the doorways, the windows, the interior shapes and elements and using balsa or basswood. You could use foam core strips, other things to just create a basic structure that I can glue together and create my interior space. I'm not gluing these into the nook itself yet. I'm just really building the environment. The nice thing about this is I'm not really overly committed, which I do have commitment issues, but I'm not overly committed to any one wall, any one thing, because the materials are cheap and I can change my mind and I'm not gluing things into the actual nook itself. So there's not this permanency to it right away. I can't tell you how many of these little orange clamps or clips I use. It is not a bad idea to have a whole bucket load of those things floating around. I did actually create the floor on the, the base of the nook itself. There's actually some real issues potentially with this. And I've, I've just finished another nook where I created a floor using the same sort of tag board and basswood process. And I think that's going to be how I move forward with it. But by gluing that flooring directly onto the nook itself, the issue is that you can end up with some warping because I am applying paints and finishes to it, which can contract and cause bowing. The other thing is there is no space under the floor. And in a second, you're going to see that I've had to leave a channel for wiring to get some lighting up to the front of the nook. That's why there's some empty spaces in the flooring itself. By creating a panel 
that you glue the floor to and you raise it with the edges with the basswood strips, now I've got actually sort of a subflooring that I can run wiring and do other things with lighting. There's a little bit of a curved panel in the back. That's going to be for the wall of the stairwell. And you'll be able to see how there's some stone in there. That door on the right is going to be a stairway or the illusion of a stairway leading up. All of the stonework is regular insulation foam. And I cut it on a hot wire cutter. You could use a utility knife. Uh, just as easily and then I put it in a container with some big uh, bolts and just shake those around to rough them up. The wiring is for two neopixels. One is going to be for the flame that is underneath the cauldron and the other one will be wired up and you can see three little pins there that will connect to the other neopixel that will be in the cauldron. It's always also a good idea to break up the vertical space and create some interesting, some interesting sort of weight and balance to size just to, to make it a little bit more asymmetrical. So a chunk of foam across the top for an arch and then just a lot of foam stonework. I varied the thickness of them so that there is a lot of depth and dimensionality to them to prevent them from getting really monotonous. There's a little bit of gap that I've left in all of them and I'm taking this really ultra lightweight spackle that I just found at the local hardware store and I'm just grouting it in there. This stuff is really, really lightweight, but I think pretty much any normal wall filling compound or spackle will do the trick. This is just kind of nice because it doesn't feel like it's adding a lot of mass to the project itself. The ever popular Mod Podge and black paint is applied next to toughen up the surface of the foam, but also give us a nice solid dark base to start painting. I use the grays straight out of the bottle. And that helps with color matching as I progress through the project. Uh, so I don't end up with things looking radically different. I'm just going to pick out with a sort of lighter or medium gray, doesn't really matter, some random stonework just to help prevent this from being monotonous and everything be all the same. Nature is really not very consistent and so having randomness is always a nice part of the project. This doesn't have to be pretty. It's actually pretty ugly. I did not spend a lot of time trying to make them even or paint within the lines really. There's a lot of washes, medium washes, followed by uh, dry brushing, followed by big dark washes that go over the whole thing. And by the time everything is done, I've probably put maybe six or seven or more layers of paint on them. I'm, I tend to probably go a little overboard and I really should try and get better at knowing when to stop. I needed to make these little wall sconces uh, have a separate video that I will link to in the description, but I tried a bunch of different things and ended up just making these out of some copper wire. And they're for these little LEDs, these super tiny little uh, grain o wheat sort of LEDs. And it's, it's really just twisted wire and a bunch of um, paint. <laughs> There's a lot of paint on those to kind of make them feel like something else. There's a lot of LEDs in this. There are multiple RGB LEDs and then multiple UV LEDs. And so for the top panel, once I cut all the holes for them, all of these random little blocks are really just to disguise and hide them. I'm not spending a ton of time actually painting the ceiling. It's really more the impression of stonework rather than actually trying to make something look like more stone. I hope people aren't spending a lot of time looking at the ceiling of the thing. 
It's really about disguising those openings so they're not obvious and glaring. A nifty little trick that I think is pretty common in dollhouse making is to use this copper tape. This is actually copper tape for stained glass, but I can use that to create my wiring and I can wire the leads of the LEDs, the standard LEDs straight to it. So taking this copper tape and then burnishing it down, I'm able to create kind of a little circuit board or traces on the ceiling. And it's actually really it's really handy because if you were to actually have to try to create wires and solder wires for all of the leads on the LEDs, it starts to really be a pretty tedious process. You have to be a little thoughtful in how you run all of your traces uh, so that you get a nice, you know, so you actually don't have to overlap. That's always a, a problem. You have to be sort of thoughtful so that the, they don't uh, cross over each other. But like I said, this is really a pretty handy little technique. Once it's all done, you end up with something that looks like a really big chunky circuit board. And then it's important to go back in and where they overlap, where you've created these little corners to drop a little bit of solder in there to make sure that everything works. It's always also good to test once everything is soldered up. Each LED does have its own resistor, so I'm not trying to get fancy with my resistors. This looks kind of overwhelming. It's really not, um, it's really some, some basic stuff that I've done in the past. So if we break it down, what we start with is we have a Nano, Arduino Nano. And what it's doing is it's controlling a DF mini player. So this is our audio player. And then it is tying also into our these little posts for the RGB LEDs. And then I've got power and power in, and then there's gonna be another button that sort of toggles the sound on and off. I haven't put that in quite yet. And then up above, these are just where I've connected the rest of the regular LEDs in. And they've got some little, um, some little variable resistors in there, but you know, that's really not super necessary. It turned out they were a pretty little value. All of the furniture is really just knocked up using sheets of balsa or basswood. And the one thing to keep in mind is you want to kind of rough things up, scuff them up, you know, sort of put some little dents and dings in them to make them feel a little more realistic. But chipboard pins for rivets, things like that, just using whatever's at hand. For painting, I found that airbrushing was the best way to handle the UV paints. So in this case, I've got a base coat for the cauldron here, and you can see these little glass beads that are the bubble beads, but I kept struggling with the UV paint. So what I ended up doing is actually just giving it a big, even coat of the UV paint in green using an airbrush. Then taking this little silicone tip and some liquid latex masking material, I masked in my drips, and then I gave it another coat of the cauldron color and then peeled off the masking. The rest of the painting is pretty much kind of normal painting techniques, base coat, dry brushing, washes, more dry brushing, more washes, and all of the little little bits and bobs, those are 3D printed on a resin printer uh, from files I generally found on Thingiverse. I'll post some links in the description, uh, but 3D printed and then just gradually building up those elements. For the book, for the words, I actually used some printer water slide decal paper. So this is not my mad micro printing skills. It is just some stuff printed using a regular inkjet printer on some slide decal paper and then applied to the book, which was 3D printed. And then slowly build up all the little bits and pieces. Really kind of hated this part because of the UV paint. It is not pleasant to work with. 
it's really streaky and, and really airbrushing was the best way to get the smoothest approach. For things like the chains on the wall, you don't really want those things moving around too much. So once I created them using just some regular jewelry chain and some copper wire and some bits of plastic, I take some thin set glue and just run it down and let that cure in order to create a rigid chain. The same could be done with rope so that you don't end up with rope changing or shifting once your book nook is completely assembled. Now for the lettering, I am fortunate enough to have a laser cutter, but this could be done with a silhouette or a Cricut cutter that's used for scrapbooking. It could also just be left blank with some additional elements added to create a really cool frame. A lot of the coolest things come from sort of the humblest of materials. I'm making sure here now that Snow White does not have scary dentures. We don't know that for a fact. We do know that these are potentially cautionary tales. So the lesson or moral here may be children, you should be brushing your teeth or you may end up with scary dentures. Now, I started by gluing the letters, applying the glue to the letters individually, and in retrospect, that was really not brilliant. I didn't need to. There's no reason to not just put it on all of the wood and put a big old slab of glue down because I'm just going to paint it anyway. So live and learn. Do not do what I do in this particular instance. But the one little tip here is I am working from the center out so that I don't run out of space by starting at one end and then working my way across and then running out on the far right. So working from the middle outward kind of helps prevent running out of space if your spacing is a little off. The nice thing about the littler letters, a lot of them I kind of got multiples all kind of connected to one another so it wasn't as difficult. But here I learned I applied the glue to the wood so that I wasn't trying to you know be super precise. You know, sometimes you do things and you, in retrospect, look back and go, what was I thinking? Now, clearly, even though I said I had learned my lesson, here I am right back to applying small amounts of glue around the edge of the part of the poison apple frame. So, yeah, um, I'm not sure what to tell you there. The apple itself was another 3D printed, resin printed piece that was from a file that I found online. When everything is said and done with all of the glue up here, the next step is going to be to give it a nice good coat of a filler primer. So like an automotive standard old regular rattle can automotive filler primer. And then I'll give it some stone texture by using a low pressure airbrush and just spattering some texture on it. A little bit of wash, a little bit of gold paint, and it brings the whole front of the piece to life. I did veneer the box. Um, I used some pretty toxic brain damage contact cement. And in retrospect, um, I stained it and then I ended up just fundamentally at the end of the day, I just ended up spray painting it. I tried stain and it just was killing me. It was too much grain, too much of everything. So a nice, even neutral spray paint. And I think that really kind of gave it sort of the thing that it needed. Didn't need to be as much as I thought. All that's left is to add a piece of glass and then it is wrapped up and ready to go.
And there you have it. I hope you found this entertaining, interesting, inspiring. If you did, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you back again really soon, hopefully really soon, a lot sooner than this video took, uh, with another random making encounter.